And yeah, welcome. Um, we'll be looking at writing a creative brief. Uh, ben will be taking you through that. Um, and for me, it'll be managing difficult conversations. So yeah, I hope you're all good um, and you're looking forward to a really good session. Um, so the next slide, please, Ben. So um, who are we? What are we doing here? What are we chatting about? So I am Adam Crawford. Um, I don't look like that usually. That's a really good photo. Um, I work as a marketing manager for Sainsbury's Bank. Um, and I also volunteer on the side in a digital marketing capacity for a professional um, football club in Scotland. Um, it's the classic kind of icebreaker thing we thought we'd do a fun fact. So in terms of me, um, I've got a little bit of David Bowie um, in me, not as extreme, um, but I've got something called heterochromia, which means I have different coloured eyes, which less than 1% of the population have. So yeah, that's me. On to Ben. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Ben. I am a junior art director at Made Brave. Um, been there for about three years now. Um, I was two years as a designer before that and then before joining Made Brave I did design and went to college at Edinburgh. So that's a bit of a history. And then for my little fun fact, I have three of my name's friends tattooed on my feet from a drunken decision when I was in Magaluf. And um, luckily they're all still my friends, kind of, but um, yeah, no regrets. Fair enough. So what we thought was quite good as well, is just if everyone can um, ping a little bit about themselves um, into the chat, um, just who you are um, and what your role is really, don't worry about the fun fact. I know I normally hate that. Um, so that's fine. Um, just chuck it in and we can just kind of say hello to everyone. So that sounds good. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, so it's like, what are we doing here? Um, what is Future Leaders? So Ben and I are your voice here um, for FLAG, that's Future Leaders Advisory Group. And um, our group kind of um, give messages, advise, and people a little bit further up into the marketing society on what we can do uh, for first rulers and future leaders. Um, in terms of these sessions, we want them to be smaller, more informal, uh, very practical sessions aimed at first rulers and future leaders, um, giving more practical advice that you can actually take away into your different roles and making things tangible. You can go away immediately, um, and even if it's just one thing that you guys take away from today, um, that'll be a massive win in our eyes. And in terms of um, something one of our colleagues in FLAG coined, making the obvious, obvious, um, being as straight up and simple as possible with um, a lot of this um, is what we want to do. Not too much waffling. I know Ben is a, a brilliant presenter. Um, I'll try not to waffle too much, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, and next slide, um, Ben will be kicking us off on um, how to write a creative brief. He's got brilliant experience in that. And at the end of that piece, um, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. And then I'll talk about managing difficult conversations. And then again, have a little bit of time for questions like, on that specifically. Um, and I know sometimes questions can take a little bit of time to appear. You have to digest the information a little bit. So at the very end, we'll have a little bit of time for more questions that you might have from throughout the session. Um, and we can have a bit of a discussion as well if there's any discussion points um, you want to make. And I just want to emphasize as well that this is a super informal session and no question or discussion point is too small. Please do fire away. Um, and we'll do our best to answer. So over to you, Ben. You know, so I will be talking about how to write a creative brief and I've tried to make this as fun as possible and adding in tons of gifts and hopefully a few people laugh because let's be honest, how to write a creative brief isn't the most interesting of presentations. So um, I've tried to make it fun. So we'll continue. So what I'm going to talk about is example briefs or briefs that I've worked on and the type of briefs I normally see from day to day. I'll write, talk about how to write a detailed brief. So this is like the ultimate brief you'll be writing, how to write a short brief. And then our key theme for this whole talk is know your audience. So this is really um, 
you really need to know this for who you're going to brief and how that's going to help. So, and then also key takeaways going to the end. So I don't know if anyone follows Rob Mayhew on TikTok, but he talked about agency life and there's these two little sketches he came up with about briefing and they're quite funny. So the first one is basically a client-led brief and other ones when the brief comes into the agency. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you watch this. Hello, I'm Mother Earth. Come on in. Uh, the new owner of Patagonia. I mean, I'm the provider of all that is on earth, but Patagonia has been handed over to me on a more official capacity. Uh, people call me uh, Mother Earth, Earth Mother, uh, Mother Nature. You can call me Julie. Uh, you all look very nervous, but just relax. Honestly, it's very exciting for me to be uh, to be working with you. It's not often I get to do these meetings, which is why I have run outs um, with the brief. So let's go around the table and introduce ourselves. Uh, a bit about me, I'll go first. I am the personification of nature. I am the provider of all that is on earth, including briefing you all. Uh, in fact, no, no need for intros, as I am all that is everything and all knowing. Uh, we are looking for three creative platforms, bronze, silver, gold, all the elements. Well, bronze is actually a metal, metal alloy, so, but you get the point. Uh, please provide budgets and timings. Uh, weekly status call would be amazing. Um, I'm not a big fan of emails after 6 p.m. I mean, after 4.5 billion years of being mother of all things, I'd like to set some boundaries. Um, oh, are these pastries from prep? Lovely. <laughs> so I hope that everyone heard that. I just got a little pop-ups in play music. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that's quite like a typical briefing conversation that goes on between agency and client. Um, and then this is basically when the creatives or the creative team get the brief. So this one's I find a little bit more funny because I can relate to it a bit better. Uh, yeah, this is amazing. Thank you. An actual written brief. Uh, incredible. This is a new brief. What's the budget? Have you got signed scope? Remember, no PO, no go. A new brief. Is this it? Okay, only three weeks. Hi, Rob. Oh, shit. <laughs> When's it needed for? So yeah, I'm definitely on the creative side, so they're definitely relatable. Anyway, so moving on. Um, so this is basically the simplified agency briefing process. So the brief comes in from the client side, and then it gets handed to the creative directors, the strategists, and the account managers, and they distill that brief down and work together to create a creative brief, which then is handed to the creative team to basically come up with the concept of the idea. Um, and I'm obviously on the creative side, so I'll be talking about my experience within this section. Um, so here's some example briefs. I found some from massive agencies from all over the world. So on the left-hand side, we've got Ogilvy. Um, and obviously you can see here, it's quite a succinct brief with like a lot of information going on. But then from creative brief, they put it very simple. It's just task, thought, and because. So you get different types of briefs. Um, here's an example from BBDO. So they use the get who to by telling them the reason why model. And um, again, just a way of communicating the brief as quickly as possible. I've worked on briefs that are six pages long. They're not fun. Um, and I've also worked on briefs where there's no briefs and it is someone basically just trying to talk to me about what they're thinking. And these never work. So please do not do them. Always write it down on paper so everyone knows what exactly is going on. So basically all a brief consists of is summarizing these three points. You have your background, your audience, and your strategy. If you can summarize these three, you have a brief. So I'm going to dive into these a little bit deeper and how to write a detailed brief. Um, might be a good brief, maybe, I don't know. We'll see how things go on. Um, so just a disclaimer if I go on, I am agent side, obviously. So I can only talk from my experience and the briefs that I've seen. So this may vary from uh, job role to job role. So Jumping into the background. So the, one of the most important things is project information. So this is to keep everyone in line of what the client, who the client is, what the project is, the date, the job number, if there is a job number there, the version number of the brief. So these go through like various rounds from like version one. I've seen a version five at some points, <laughs> which is mad. Um, the client services leads. So the person is managing the project from the account side. The creative lead, which is going to be the creative director that everyone's below. So like art directors and copywriters are going to see and feed ideas into. And the strategy lead is the person that came up with the strategy behind the project. So 
Next important point to put in is the key timing. So it doesn't have to be as mad as a Gantt chart with like specific dates, but it's just looking for key check-ins with creative directors, account managers, and then finally put the final client presentation date in there so the creative team can work towards that. Um, budget. So list all budgets available. Um, and it's valuable for the creatives to know this just in case you're working with a tight budget. They can be a bit more thought through with their ideas and obviously adhere to that budget. You don't want to put something, not put a budget with it, then it'd be small and they have this massive idea and this big production cost that is not possible at all. So list as many budgets as there are. There's sometimes overall a production budget, et cetera, et cetera. So put the background in a nutshell, as Gordon Ramsay says here, just describe the bloody dish. We don't need jargon. We just need to know what is the background. Summarize this as quickly as possible. Sometimes people even skip it. Um, and then finally, deliverables. What is the actual outcomes of this brief? Um, brief so people, so the creatives can know the outputs, basically. Um, so yeah, again, valuable when we are creating concepts. Secondly, the audience. So who are we talking to? So detail who the brief is for. Get specific as possible. Talk about the demographics, the age, the community these people are in, the salaries, all this knowledge is going to help the creatives create the best work suitable for the right audience. So if you can detail this as much as possible, it's only going to get the best outcome. Next is what do we want them to do? So what's the call to action? Do we want them to sign up to a newsletter? Do we want them to buy a product? Do we want them to change perspective or even change beliefs? And I have like, this is a thing, especially when you go into like political advertising that's not a thing now but was back in like 1960s <laughs> and what probably is still a thing now let's be honest and finally on the audience what is the insight so this is the i've tried to change the color here because this is the most important part of the brief this can take three weeks to three months of work for strategy to come up with this insight and it's basic an insight is obtained oh, hold on let me move this um obtained by analyzing data patterns, behavior, and a deep understanding of the audience and the competitors. So distill this down into eight words, but also provide a paragraph of how you arrive at this insight. So I have some examples here from two of my favorite advertising campaigns. So on the left, we have Nike, find your greatness. So the observation here was not everyone aspires to be a competitive athlete, but why? And their insight was it's not obtainable or believable. So the idea was find your greatness. It's all about you as a specific person rather than these stereotypes people are adhering to. On the right is hands down the best campaign I've ever seen in my life. And I would highly recommend watching it if you've not. But it's for a shaving product called Billy. That's for women shavers. And I don't know if anyone uses them, but... The observation here was all women shaving ads never show body hair. Um, and if you think about it, it's actually quite scary to watch adverts and they're all shaving clean skin. <laughs> it's mad. Um, so the insight here was there is a need for a brand to challenge these stereotypes. And their idea was the new body brand. So it was basically showing hair on women's bodies for the first time in advertising. And this was only like 2018, 19, which is quite mad. So now we get into the strategy side of things. So what is the proposition? This is an easy to understand reason to why the audience should believe or act upon the creative brief strategy and your idea. So it's this middle ground between the brand experience and product. Why should the audience believe this? So provide detail to why this product or service is suited for the audience and stands out against the competitors. So again, think back to those insights that we just seen with Billy and Nike. So that was a, a key moment in the competitors that they could hone in on. So any other mandatories or other, other information? So is there anything else that we're missing from the brief? Or can you share previous competitor work or links and other references that is going to um, help the creatives create the best idea possible? So now that is like a massive run through of how to write a detailed brief and that is quite a detailed brief and um, but you can obviously write a short brief so as we talked about if you can summarize these points the background the audience and the strategy you have a creative brief 
So again, jumping back to this BBDO example, we have get, which is obviously into the background, who is the audience and the strategies to, and again, by telling them and reason why. So that's our algorithm you can use. So it's get, who, to, by. Another one is what, so what, now what. So if you can summarize that, you have a creative brief. Lastly, know your audience. So know who you're briefing because it will make the world of difference for the creative idea. So information is power. So for example, if you're creating, if you're creating a brief for an agency, make the brief as detailed as possible. So when it comes up with the idea, it meets exactly your expectations. So don't mess anything out. But if you're collaborating, um, and partnering with an artist, then the brief can be short and loose, right? You want, you're hiring them for their expertise. You're not telling art how to do a specific paint brush stroke. Keep the, the brief loose so their expertise can elevate your ideas. If you're briefing a photographer or production agency, it's somewhere in the middle. So you want to be detailed and supply examples of how you see your vision coming to life. So this can be with mid boards, storyboards, and explain each scene, uh, scene by scene, but at the same time, collaborate, collaborate with them, learn from the expertise because it will elevate their work. So finally, some key takeaways, always write a brief, send the brief to whoever you're briefing, and then plan a meeting and talk over the brief. So if you send it to them, it gives them a chance to read it through completely, and then they come prepared with questions and then when you have that meeting, you can narrow out everything of their concerns. So, and please never just plan a meeting and talk through some of your ideas, always write it down. Um, and yeah, fourth one, long or short, if you summarize the background, audience and strategy, then you have a brief. And insight, 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 if it takes three hours, three days or three months, just make sure your insight is succinct and in a good direction that's against all the other competitors. And lastly, know who you're briefing. So again, jumping back to these points, this will make a massive help when you're briefing who you are. Cool. On to Adam. I think as well, if there's any questions, um, feel free to put your hand up, give us a shout so Ben can answer them. I think Kathleen oh, has a physical hand up. Sorry, yeah, I keep forgetting them on Zoom. Um, thank you for that, Ben. Um, so our students quite often have to write briefs or they get given briefs and then they have to start thinking about insight for their idea. Yep. And we kind of do insight idea execution as a structure for the lot of their reports. And the insight is definitely something that they struggle with massively. And I think it's something that people struggle with when they first go into roles as well. Yep. And I was just wondering if you had sort of any places you would suggest or wait you know ideas to get started because I think getting started on insight can or knowing when you've reached that point can be quite hard yeah. sometimes I think what's hard because are you lecturing like design students or what's the type of so it's marketing advertising and PR so they are yeah. doing this the account side of stuff but also doing digital imaging creating designs creating campaigns from scratch so it's a real mix <laughs> yeah. well I think like obviously when you move into agency side of things you have a whole department with experts yeah. that are coming up with these insights I was at college and studying design and we did a lot of campaigns we had to come up with insights yourself as well um, and the easiest one I think is finding a statistic and then creating an idea from that statistic. Obviously there's no like short way of doing it. It's just how, like getting the graph done and trying to Google everything. And then I don't know, chat GPT it now maybe, and it might give you some references. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's no like easy way of doing it. I think you also have to be decisive. So once you have an insight that is interesting, just stick with it. I mean, like yeah. I, I was definitely like spent three months trying to research and research on all of these college projects and trying to find the best insight. It actually might not be there, but if you can like have something that is the statistic and then back that idea up against it, then I think you're in a good place. So yeah, I would just be, there's no easy answer for it. I think you've got to do the research, but also 
um, yeah, just like move on with things as well. Yeah. Okay, that's good. We're on the right track then. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All good. Any other questions? All good. You're right. Cool. Okay, on to me. If you hear me shouting at Ben, it's not our relationship. He's um, leading on the slides, so he can just flick through. Um, but I am going over managing difficult conversations. A really, really interesting topic. Um, I'll start with the definition of it. So a difficult conversation is one whose primary subject matter is potentially contentious and or sensitive and may elicit strong complex emotions that can be hard to predict or control. Managing difficult conversations happen in everyday life, whether it's personal or at work, but really it's it's something that um, we're really bad at, if I'm very honest. And next slide, please, Ben. I was saying to the guys um, before, I never thought all of these people would be on the same slide, if I'm honest. I never thought I'd be talking about Sarin Sinek, uh, President Barack Obama, Thomas the Tank Engine, and me all in the same breath, um, but here we are. Um, so Simon Sinek, an academic who talks a lot about uncomfortable conversations. Uh, president or former President Barack Obama, obviously having to deal with several um, very tricky conversations uh, around the world. Um, Thomas the Tank Engine, um, I was watching an episode of this a while back um, with my little brother, and um, I don't watch it uh, generally, um, and that was about dealing with a tricky conversation um, that they had in the programme. And then me, I come from a background of hating these sort of conversations. When I was younger, um, the one memory that really comes to mind is I didn't want to go and ask for ketchup or barbecue sauce from the McDonald's counter because I was really, really afraid of the confrontation. I thought, you know, they're going out of their way to get me the sauces. Not great at all. Um, I would get my sister to do it. But coming from a place of that, um, to working in a marketing environment for about six or seven years now in a lot of different areas, whether that be sport, whether that be like legal services um, or accounting. Um, it's something that I've really worked hard to do. And the point here is that it touches absolutely everything, does difficult conversations, and it's important that we get better at them. The next slide, um, Ben. Um, so this encapsulates that point. Um, people would rather do anything else. Um, according to Chartered Management Institute, 57% of people would do almost anything not to have conflict, not to have difficult conversations. And they feel really negatively impacted by um, these sort of conversations as well. 66% of people feel stress or anxious if they have it coming up. And I think a lot of us can probably resonate with that. Um, and even senior managers in that, they really don't do a good job of delivering it. I mean, 43% of senior managers admit to losing their tempers and shouting when placed in difficult conversations, which I'll go on to talk about isn't really the best way of dealing with these things. And 40% admitted to panicking and lying during a difficult discussion. Um, next slide, please, Ben. So this further, further encapsulates it. I've, I've got a couple of clues on the right, but what would be good is if you just ping in the chat what you think the most difficult conversations people have in the workplace are, I would caveat this with it's one already, yeah. Um, it's not, it can be personal, but within the workplace as well. Performance, salary, it could be like 10 seconds. Yeah. All oh, really good. Perfect. Cool. Right. Well, take it away, Ben. So first one, pay. Um, we're in a cost of living crisis. That's no surprise. And people want their salaries to increase and um, to keep up with inflation and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, inappropriate behaviour is right up there in the workplace. The next one, uh, feedback on poor performance. People find that really tricky. Uh, next one, promotions. Um, very difficult. Romantic relationships and breakups is in there as a conversation that people have at work. I mean, I've never had that work, but yeah, and that's in there as well. Family relationships, um, a tricky subject too, with a lot going on um, in terms of family. Money, that's kind of there again, quite similar to pay. And there's health 
as well. And I really like this point to kind of final my, my kind of contextualization of this subject, which is research, research shows that Brits find it harder to ask for a raise or feedback and poor performance than they do breaking up with a partner. So we've got a problem. We really need to address this. We need to work harder at, you know, understanding why we've got such an issue with this and what we can do to help. So some digestible feedback on what I believe you can do for difficult conversations. And I'd caveat with this with, this is a human thing. Everyone is very different, got different types of styles. These are the sorts of things that I would um, say to go for, but you might feel that some of the points maybe wouldn't be quite your style. So just a caveat there. And I'm going to do it in a linear fashion. So I'm going to look at before, during, and after these sorts of conversations. So next slide, please, Ben. So before the conversation, in my opinion, um, and from the feedback I've had um, before this call, talking to people quite high up in different organizations about you know, managing difficult conversations, how do you overcome that? The absolute key was building relationships. Um, and that was um, that's before the conversation happens, during, after your life within the organization, you should be trying to build relationships as best as you can, because difficult conversations are also personal in a way in the workplace. It's about your connection with that individual. So as much as you can, building these relationships across the organization with lots of different people, that will help you down the line. People will trust you more, you'll be more approachable, and they'll be more willing to meet you in the middle um, with these sorts of tricky conversations. And another really good piece of advice that I've had in the past um, by some people I really, really respect in the workplace are take people on the journey continuously. Whether it's a weekly stand-up, a monthly stand-up that you have, make yourself visible um, and show your expertise to the organization as much as you can, as much as you're comfortable doing. There's different ways of doing it. But that builds trust in you and your expertise. Um, and if you do that, again, people are more likely to take your feedback on board and the difficult conversations can become a little bit easier. So I would plan the exchange is the next point. And um, so basically determining um, why do you need to have the conversation? Is it a performance piece? Is it something else? And um, what do you want to achieve from the conversation? Is there a very specific outcome that you want to go out of that having? Um, and this one, in my opinion, is really, really important. Something that people don't actually consider a lot of the time. Well, I don't anyway. Um, what may the other person's view be? So say you're talking to like quite a high up manager, understanding what pressures they have as well is super important to how you actually have the discussion. They might um, have members of the board talking to them about commercial elements or something similar like that. Just have a think about what are their pain points within that particular role? Could there be something impacting this conversation? And um, there's other things that come from building relationships, like ha have you got an understanding of their drivers, their pain points? Maybe something that you kind of caught up on before, you know, they've had, they've been moving house, they've got a family matter, those sorts of things, keeping those in mind for the conversation as well can be really important. And being as well informed of the subject and situation as possible is crucial. Uh, data is your best friend here because objectivity um, and honesty is your best friend within these conversations. Um, I've worked a lot on email channels in the past. And so when I've had like, oh, there's something going on with the open rate, there's something going on click through it, I've made sure that before that meeting goes on, I get as much kind of information, as much data I can on those particular subjects um, so that I'm in the know. And if we are having to have a discussion, I've got all that data that I deem relevant um, to hand. And that, again, helps someone meet you in the middle if they think you're more knowledgeable in the subject. Um, and provide an opportunity for preparation on both sides. This kind of comes into the fact that, yeah, I, I would just ask someone um, if they've got time, like this week, on, on, on picking something up. I think speed can be good in certain circumstances, but only if it works. Um, sometimes speed can make someone a bit flustered. They don't have enough time to prepare, and the discussion's nowhere near as good, nowhere near as fruitful. Um, so giving them time, having that almost pre-conversation conversation, um, and seeing when they're available. Positive framing in this, or neutral framing can be good, particularly in like a meeting invite or something like that as well. 
um, not framing it as urgent, like we need to deal with this and just saying, you know, we need to chat about this query um, can help someone feel a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more calm, and then the outcome will be better as well off the back of that. Um, it's also important to set an agenda, um, basically saying what this is about, what you'll be chatting about and that as well, so that they're not just getting a, a meeting invite out of nowhere. I've had that in the past where you are so scared, you have no idea what's going on. Um, a little agenda goes a long way. Um, next slide, please, Ben. So this slide had a different photo initially, and then I read an article that was like succession, how not to have difficult conversations. And I was like, that is absolutely perfect. I don't, hopefully most of you have seen it and you get that reference, um, but it's aggressive conversations. It's like verbal, non-verbal communications, awful. Um, it's all about winning and one-upping um, the other person, not really caring about feelings. There's a lying, conniving going on as well. So if there's anything that you take from this slide, just do the opposite of what people in succession do. Um, that comes to the first point, which is adopt the right approach. Um, it's about getting people on side um, and seeing the conversation as an opportunity to improve. Um, it's like growth mindset is an academic concept where like if you're if you feel more positive and feel like there's an opportunity there, something can be achieved, then it's more likely to then be achieved. And um, so going into it with that again, like pos positive framings, super important. And the main thing of all of this, I mean, whether it's client side, whether it's agency side, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you're pulling in the same direction. So it's about keeping that in mind. And whether it's a business goal um, or whether it's a team goal, there will be something that will be similar between both of you. Remember that. Um, and that comes into the next point, point which is recognize and manage your emotional state. Um, how you feel about the actual discussion. You might be anxious worried, try and be as positive about these sort of discussions going into them as possible, because that then reflects and helps the other person meet you halfway. Um, how you feel about the issue being discussed, something I've had in the past personally, uh, and a few times in like different um, workspaces, is people cling on to projects that are like theirs and that sort of thing. So if someone's come at you, they're wanting to have a difficult conversation about a project that's yours, Try and distance yourself, take the bias away from that conversation and ditch any assumptions that you have um, so that you can have a really good conversation with them about that matter. Because um, otherwise, when the emotion comes into it, it's just not good anymore. Um, and how you feel about the person, that's so important. You might love them, you might get on with them like house on fire. Um, you just need to make sure that... Um, you're getting what you want out of the conversation. You're not being like, ah, oh, it's Ben. I love Ben. You know what? It doesn't really matter. We'll, we'll take it easy. That That's not the right approach either. And similarly, it's not like, oh, Mel, you know, me and Mel do not get on. What's, sorry, Mel. Sorry, you're the negative one. We don't get, um, go, get on at all. I'm going to go in here and I just want to win. I just want to get my view across. And um, that's also the wrong thing to do. Honesty and objectivity throughout is, is, is the best course of, course of action. And there's verbal and non-verbal pieces here as well. I'm quite laid back just in the way I do things. That's my style. Um, and I try and be as consistent as possible um, in delivery, presentation, no matter what it is, no matter if it's just a, a weekly update or it's in one of these conversations. And in my opinion, that's the best way to be because people know what they're getting. It takes that fear out of, oh, this guy's going to come in and absolutely go off at me. Um, this sounds like so simple, but it is it is spot on. Avoid sarcasm, blaming or accusatory statements. Um, and also just be careful with your kind of joking about as well, because in tough conversations and difficult conversations, um, a joke can be construed in, in, in the wrong way. Um, ensure your posture is positive and not confrontational. And overall, this is all about making the other person feel at ease. So that again, um, a constant theme in this is them coming and meeting you halfway for a solution. Um, listening is extremely important, active listening. You need to understand where they're coming from, what the issues are and why, all of those sorts of things. 
um, interrupting, I think, is a big kind of British thing in the way that we converse with one another. We just jump in left, right and centre. And if you can, yeah, avoid that because you want to get the full story from someone. Um, and that feeds into silence can be your best friend. There's a guy called Adar Cohen who does TED Talks. And he also lectures at Harvard. And he's got a PhD in conflict resolution, done stuff in Northern Ireland, like with conflicts between religions and all that. And he says some of the best resolutions he's ever got have been out of the silence in a conversation. And sitting back and giving people time and space to just kind of consider a point or, or resort their thoughts and then come back as well, which is super important. And this is a, um, a value at Sainsbury's Bank as well, which I resonate strongly with and think should be throughout kind of all the stuff you're doing, but be human. It's a, it is an emotional thing, just inherently difficult conversations. So if someone does react, don't take it personally, be compassionate, be empathetic and listen, um, which is an absolute key. And next slide, please, Ben. <laughs> so uh, during the conversation online as well, so this is me, and um, this is not this is what not to do um, in a conversation, to be honest, particularly if it's a tricky one. And um, this is me after a big project, I will caveat, um, I was exhausted, not that it's okay. Um, but uh, be present within one of these conversations. It can be easy not to do when you're online, because you're not actually there. Um, and a lot of that is about getting rid of distra distractions. Um, for me, I've normally got like three screens, um, but when it's something super important, I actually turn those screens off because I'll end up doing work um, and I focus like primarily on that. Other really simple things, taking your phone out of the room if it's super important because you're getting loads of buzzes from teams and all that sort of thing. And even simple as like shutting the door, my washing machine is the loudest thing on earth. So I need to just like shut about four doors in the way so that I can only hear a little bit, but you know, that's part of the thinking process so that we're not getting in any interruptions. Um, camera on, some workplaces aren't that keen on it, but I would say if you're having one of these conversations where it is gonna be tough and um, there's, there's gonna be issues, camera on is good for your verbal, non-verbal communication there. And um, hands up. Um, taking after Kathleen earlier with her physical hand up. Um, there's tools on Teams and, and Zoom as well, but that takes the kind of interrupting piece out of the equation, which allows someone to you know have their time to say what they want to say. And then when they're ready, they can come to the hands up and say, right, on, on, on you go, Adam. Um, for me, a big piece that helps me be present is like something to fiddle with. So I've got this these little Lego pieces. I'm very fidgety. I get distracted really easily. So having something, especially online, that I can sit and it does distract me, um, but in a kind of positive way so that I can be present in the meeting is good. Um, and key, checking the tech beforehand. There's nothing worse than having stress around like a particular meeting already going in and you, know, you don't know the tech, the tech doesn't work, you're five minutes late. Just make sure you're 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 um, checking the tech beforehand. And um, next slide, please, Ben. So these are two different kind of examples because email, like tough conversations, and email can be a bit different. Um, and I took examples that I thought were quite good, and um, quite nice things to receive in an email, and then something that I thought was not a good email. So you've got lots in that left one there. You've got just a simple subject line, not urgent or anything. Um, starting, I start most of my emails this way. I hope you're well, and that shows you know this person knows what Ben's up to. He's been on holiday last week. That's positive. Um, they've got all the stats in there, and um, so they know their stuff, um, and they're showing understanding in terms of like I know there's been technical factors, there've been changes in the team. Extremely positive, and also you know they know a new templates. Um, been introduced they understand there was an ios update that may have impacted open rate they've got their finger on the pulse they've done the research and then they are saying if there's anything i can help with please do let me know if there's a a time this week you know that we can meet me up brilliant and that's again like one of the first slides i did was about giving them a, a bit of time so there's that as opposed to emails that i think we've probably all received in the past that are just super to the point, lovely emails, um, just Ben or urgent, poor email stats, response required, urgent. 
Um, and it's like, what's going on? That's a big phrase for me. Um, frustratingly, our email performance is far below our target. Um, this is damaging the trust and uh, the business has in the team and reflecting bad on us all, which I'm quite angry and concerned about. It's bringing emotion into the equation, which I've said so far is not a good way of dealing with things. And can you tell me uh, what your team are doing to fix this and why it's become so poor, ideally by close of play? So that's quite an urgent ask as well, which gives the person hardly any time, say this is like 3 p.m., to um, get back. So that's just kind of an indication of, you know, good and bad um, emails there. Um, next slide, Ben. Uh, after the conversation, um, whatever it is, it's so important to actually reflect on what's gone down in one of these um, catch-ups. There's academic pieces like Gibbs um, reflective cycle. So you've got a description, feeling, evaluation, analysis, conclusion, action plan. That's quite detailed. Um, but I think from a kind of academic lens, something to refer to is quite good. I would say you can cut that down into a what, why, and a how. Um, what's what's gone wrong? What's happened? Why has it happened? Um, and how can we fix it? Um, know the escalation uh, escalation process. Um, understand kind of where you need to go for certain things. That can be um, super, super important. Because um, if you don't, then you can feel very stuck and it just becomes a bit of a negative spiral. Um, know your mechanisms for getting centered again, I think is the absolute key to these conversations. A lot of it is emotional, as I've discussed, and getting yourself back into a good uh, frame of mind um, helps um, future conversations and helps you kind of digest the one that you've just had. So stepping away and having a think, particularly an email, I would recommend you get a bad email. Do not respond straight away. Give it a little bit of time, sit with it, and then go back. Because if you go shoot back at it, then it can escalate and escalate negatively. I put Duran Duran here. Um, I went through a really funny stage during lockdown. I don't know why. Uh, I've never listened to Duran Duran in, like, in the past. It was on my um, my Spotify wrapped after that, that phase. But I would go away and just listen to music and like pace the hall. That doesn't sound healthy at all, but it helped me. Um, but it's basically find the route that helps you. And for me, at that point in time, it was Duran Duran. Um, exercising um, can be really helpful. Just talking to someone, venting can be good. Um, going out, getting fresh air. Um, and Mind always say, or they say in quite a few of their um, reports, um, recl reclaim your lunch break. Um, I, I think it's it's a good point to discuss these things with work and ensure that you can get these in place. Like people ping meetings in whenever they can at lunch, all that sort of thing. And um, discuss having time for these and being able to block your lunch out. A great thing that Saints Bank do is have golden hour where they block out a lunch and that is your personal time. You, you should not be booking meetings into that. And that helps, you know, digest these sorts of conversations. Um, and we've also got smarter working, which I think is a great idea where you take time back and you go and do things and be healthy. Practice makes perfect, though, with all of this. Um, former Facebook CEO Cheryl Sandberg says that she um, wants her team to be having difficult conversations once a week and be practicing them. And I think um, the more you have these conversations, the more you put yourself in that kind of uncomfortable environment, the better you'll be with them. So definitely recommend that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is my last slide. So just some resources. Um, Mel will share the slides um, after this anyway, so you can um, click on these. But there's different kind of academic pieces, solutions-focused approach, uh, Gibbs model of reflection. There's restorative conversations and tips on that. And a lot of it's kind of your mental health, so it's mind resources, which are brilliant. And shameless plug for the mentoring stuff at the Marketing Society. Um, I've had friends um, and former colleagues that have done it and said it's brilliant. Um, and it's something that's been recommended to me many times and get a mentor and you can discuss these difficult conversations with them too. Um, so I hope that was helpful. And any questions, just shout. Well Adam. I'll take silence as a real positive, so that's fine. You did tell us to embrace the silence. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a, br yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a great point. Oh, well, well, yeah. 
Everyone's just yeah. digesting, Adam. That's what that's what this is. You're digesting, digesting. and embracing the past. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, Go for it. What if you get caught off guard by a difficult conversation, like no prior email, no meeting set up? What if somebody just kind of walks up to you and goes straight in with the that's a difficult chat? That that's a, a really good one. I think it's something that we've all been part of, to be honest. You're kind of yeah, someone catches you um, and starts going off at you. I'd say it's the emotional piece. Um, just try and be as calm and collected as possible. You don't have the stats, um, but as long as you're stood there, sat there, whatever, you're calm and you're, and a line is probably, I'll get back to you on that. Like, I, I don't know my stuff right now. I can look it up. I'll get back to you. Um, kind of de-escalate the situation is probably the best thing of doing. Um, and then I would also look at, because in my mind, that's bad behavior. That's like bad professional behaviors. And I would look at escalation with that as well. Although I say that, I would be careful about escalation because that can also ruin relationships. It depends on the dynamic of your team. But being calm, taking the emotion out of it, that should help rub off on them. But just say, well, if you have to apologize, I'm sorry, don't have any information on that right now. I'll look in, into it and get back to you on it via email or we'll set up a call. And, and and that's it. Just kind of taking all of the spice out of the conversation, I guess. Yeah. That's a really good question. Cool. Anything else? Any others? Oh, perfect. Cool. Cool. Okie dokie. <clears throat> So I'm just going to chime in. Hi, everyone. Um, just really quickly on the questions side of things, you know, if anybody doesn't feel confident asking questions on this call, you can always send us an email. Um, you know, if you want to ask Ben or Adam any specific questions after this session, please do get in touch and I can put you in touch with the guys. I'm saying that's fine with you both. <laughs> I haven't asked, <laughs> but it's going to be fine. So if you've got any questions, just let us know. Um, there is going to be a very, very short um, feedback email after this session. You know, this is the first time, first year that we've run these first role fundamental sessions and we want to get feedback from you guys and, you know, how important they are, <clears throat> whether they're constructive, they're helpful, <clears throat> excuse me, to run them for next year as well. Any feedback would be would be really, really great. We also have a WhatsApp group um, for future leaders and first role members of the society. If you haven't joined already, I'm just going to pop the link in the chat. We talk about upcoming events. And we also ask each other questions, just talk about current industry trends, etc. And also it's just a way to engage and network with other members of the society. So if you would like to join, the link is in the chat. We um, also have a very varied events program at the Marketing Society. First Rule Fundamentals is obviously one of them, but we've got various different events for different levels of members. Um, you know, the Inspiring Minds series, Industry Insights, um, Future Leaders events. So if you are interested in attending any other events coming up, um, please take a look on the website, which I will also put the link in the chat right there. <clears throat> 